Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business App. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Let's get a beat on how the U.S. farmers are doing here. Uh, and we can do that through Deer. Deer is a, a company, obviously, we all know and love. Uh, and their customers, by and large, are uh, farmers. And uh, Deer reported some numbers a little bit disappointing here. Uh, Chris Cialino joins us. He covers all the uh, big ag uh, and machinery companies for Bloomberg Intelligence. He's based down in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, Chris, how did Deer do this quarter? And what's their outlook? The quarter was great, really, um, much better than we anticipated uh, across the board beats, uh, both top line and margins for most of the businesses. Um, but the outlook was the disappointment of, of the quarter. They cut net income guidance by about 5%. Um, and, and that's largely reflective of incremental weakness in the ag business, specifically the large ag business. Um, and there's really two components to that. Um, one, Europe. Um, Deer now plans to underproduce production, uh, underproduce retail demand uh, due to some weakness in Central and Eastern Europe, given the conflict there. Um, so they're going to try to bring down inventories. They're already underproducing in Brazil as well. And then the second component of the cut um, was really some additional softness beginning to transpire here in North America. Uh, we saw some of the order velocity start to moderate. So demand seems to kind of be trending toward the low end of their down 10 to 15 percent industry outlook when it comes to large ag equipment. Yeah, let's get through some of these here. Production precision ag net sales uh, for their yearly forecast are looking down 20 percent, worse than estimated. Construction and forestry net sales down 5 to 10 percent. Small ag and turf net sales down 10 to 15 percent. Yiki, um, is this <laughs> a early cycle, mid cycle or late cycle read on the economy? Uh, I mean, we're we're early in an ag downturn. Um, last year was uh, a peak production levels. Um, you know, historically, you, you don't have one year downturn. So I would suspect this is kind of the beginning of a of a multi year downturn. And some of the numbers that you're seeing that you reference on their guidance are well below uh, you know market retail demand expectations, suggesting that you know they they have some more work to do on bringing down inventory levels um, to to more manageable levels with really the goal of setting up production for 25 in line with retail demand. All right. So if John Tucker goes on to a lot uh, to get a, you know, maybe a backhoe for his estate uh, in the Jersey Shore, he can get one, right? There's, there's plenty there on the lot. Can he, can he get some, can he get a deal? <laughs> There's no shortage of uh, uh, tractors and, and equipment on the lot. Um, you could get new, you could get used, kind of take your pick. Um, values continue to kind of come down here over the last 12 months, and I suspect you'll see further pressure um, uh, on the used side. Um, new equipment pricing, you know, Deer's kind of guiding to uh, 1.5%, which is kind of below historical averages. And remember, we're coming off of, you know, three years of really strong, phenomenal pricing. Um, so... It, returning to, a, a, I would say, a below normal historical trend, which will also be a drag on margins. Um, Caterpillar had a different kind of read, and I appreciate they also do metals and mining and stuff. So is it going to be the diversified players that are going to really win on this? Yeah, so I, th you know, construction's holding up um, certainly better than the farmer and then the ag economy. Um, a, a couple different moving pieces there. I mean, you still have a tremendous amount of infrastructure-related funds and government stimulus coming through the system um, that will not only be kind of a tailwind here in 24, but even 25 and 26. So I, I think that certainly helps offset some of the the cyclical headwinds facing both the the resi or non-residential markets. Um, but if you look at the farm economy. Um, almost kind of a, a completely different story. You look at crop prices, which are ultimately the biggest driver of farm income and, and um, uh, equipment purchases, corn, soy, wheat down, you know, 25, 35 percent mm. plus. So that's beginning to trickle through to farm incomes. Farmer incomes are going to be down 26 percent this year. Um, and I suspect we'll be under further pressure as we exit the year, too. All right, Chris Cialino, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Chris Cialino, he covers all the uh, big ag and construction, all those really cool companies uh, that are industrial America. Uh, again, our good friends at Deer uh, had a good quarter, as Chris said, but their guidance um, uh, weaker than expected. And I guess with farmer incomes down so much, that makes a lot of sense because if they don't have money in the pocket, they can't go out and uh, buy new tractors and stuff like that. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on 
Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Let's go to uh, kind of a discussion about retail sales, what we might, we saw the government numbers come out for the month of January, weaker than expected. I don't know how much of that is seasonal versus, you know, kind of something more substantial, but our next guest does. Uh, Mary Shore is Senior Equity Analyst at Columbia Threadneedle uh, Investments, uh, joining us via Zoom from Boston, Mass. So, Mari, what, what do you make of the you know retail sales numbers we had today? How concerned should we be? Yeah, it's a great question. When I look at the pretty significant slowdown that we saw in January, I think it really reflects two things. Number one, unfavorable weather, which is transitory but also the shift back to the pre-holiday trend. So when I really dig through the data, I see a continuation of three themes that we really discussed throughout last year, which is the consumer stretched and continues to spend more on services over goods and within goods on needs over wants. We also continue to see weak demand in categories that were strong during the pandemic, like home and sporting goods and electronics, And then the third theme is e-commerce taking back share from the stores. So I kind of look at this report and say it's really more of the same as to what we saw throughout 2023. So if we go to the needs over wants and spending on services, when we start to get the retailers reporting, how do we read that dynamic into those retailers? Yeah, it's a great question. It's really going to vary by category. So I think we're going to see continued growth in categories like food and health and wellness. Um, Health and wellness, I would also include in there some of the active wear brands like a Lululemon, for instance, um, and some of the athletic footwear brands. Um, And then again, continued weakness in categories like home, electronics, sporting goods, and I would say kind of flattish results in apparel. The problem is that a lot of those latter categories tend to be the higher margin categories. So they are weighing on the top line, but also weighing on margin. All right, I'm I'm asking on behalf of Alex here, talk to us about the luxury (laughs) end of the market. That's where she plays. What are we seeing there? Yeah, we're still seeing pretty weak results from the luxury players. really globally speaking. Of course, there's things happening in China, but also in North American Europe, they're talking more about macro pressures. And I think what's happening is that luxury consumers spending more on services like travel, um, and some of the luxury players that have more exposure to what I would call the aspirational luxury category. So maybe the kind of mid-tier consumers that were stretching to buy some of those higher priced goods, you know, that consumer has really slowed. And so any luxury player with greater exposure to that kind of aspirational luxury part of the category, I think is feeling the pressure more than some of like the true luxury players. Like I would say in Hermes or Chanel, those are the brands that seem to be holding up the best. Yeah, the Hermes story is just amazing. Okay, just to just, just to be clear on myself, <laughs> I don't do luxury. I only do sales. Okay, I like luxury on sale, but I like the, the like Outnet, Ukes, that kind of stuff. This means nothing to the guys in the studio <laughs> nothing, right now. Nothing. But how many how I many think, pairs of shoes do you have? Let's start. Nice there. question. Oh Here no, I actually that counted this indicate. for my old team. I don't think it's as many as you think it is. I think it's like maybe thirty. What? Wow. I have two. <laughs> what? Okay. Mari, back me up. 30 is like a very reasonable amount. Um, but I ask this because we only see a lot of sales when you got to get the inventory out the door. Am I going to be a happy yeah. consumer or am I going to be a sad consumer this year? Yeah, again, it really varies by category and brand. But I would say overall, the inventory this year was in a much better place than what we saw last year when demand really first started to slow and all of the companies found themselves sitting on excess goods. I would say as we moved into 2023, the inventory was better controlled. So when you looked at a lot of the company's results, the gross margin rate was actually stronger than a lot of investors were expecting. Part of that was, you know, lower promotions, lower markdowns than what we saw the prior year. 
So as we move through the holiday, I would say most of the promotions we saw, I would classify as in line with plan. I don't think we saw super aggressive promotions, and that really reflects the fact that most of the brands and retailers um, are sitting on pretty lean inventories right now and continue to manage their inventory very conservatively, just given the weak demand backdrop. This is sad for me. <laughs> exactly. So Mari, how about a, down at like a, at some of the dollar stores, for example, I'm not sure how that really works out. Do they, do they benefit when times get a little tough because maybe people trade down to the dollar stores or do their typical customers, do they feel it more acutely? How do they play these days? Yeah, it's a great question. Typically, you see both happening simultaneously, right? So you would see their core customer come under pressure, but that be offset by the more kind of middle income consumer trading down into those discount formats, whether it be dollar stores or even some of the off pricers like Burlington and Ross that cater to a lower income consumer. I think this cycle, we saw kind of a delayed trade down from the middle income consumer. But as we kind of move through Q4 and into this year, I think that should be more pronounced and really help some of those discount formats. Um, I also think what's happening with the dollar stores is you've seen Walmart, I think, take a lot of share, right? You, you can see it in their results when you compare Walmart to, you know, the family dollar business, which is owned by Dollar Tree and Dollar General. So I think you have a lot of things happening at the same time, but overall, a weaker macro backdrop should be a positive for those discount formats. Also, it's weird. It's like dollar stores are no longer really dollar stores. Like they're like five dollar stores, yeah. and their inventory is like horrific. I mean, in some of them, uh, yeah. We, we yeah, have a house I, of, I, go, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. I was gonna say like going in one, you're like this is like scraping bottom of the barrel of inventory. Like it is, it, it is not a pretty shelf site. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of the dollar stores have kind of struggled with the store standards and the service levels to, to that point. And both Dollar Tree and Dollar General have talked about investing in better inventory management systems, more labor in the stores to help improve the store shopping experience. All right, Mari, thanks so much for joining us. Mari Shore, Senior Equity Analyst at Columbia Threadneedle Investments, joining us via Zoom from Boston. Massachusetts Threadneedle, originally a London-based, UK-based investment love firm, announced Columbia Threadneedle because they were acquired by Columbia. Yeah. So. They, they have great, great analysts. They do. They I do. Mean, They're some, very good. Some of the best. Yeah. Not, you know, Bloomberg Intelligence and oh, Threadneedle. Yeah, very good. All good. Let's put it there. All good. All good. Yeah, but good read on the retailers here. So I, I always like paying attention to the retailers, you know, whether it's the, the Walmarts or, you know, the, the, the luxury. You just get a great view of kind of how the consumer's really hanging in there and generally has been hanging in there. For the luxury, I'm waiting for them to say, China's back, baby. They're buying mainland, they're traveling, and we haven't heard that. I don't know if it's going to happen, to I be honest. Know. If it hasn't happened know. at this time, it's really hard to make that case. Plus, even if China, even if they say that, will investors be that willing to buy that narrative when they got burned uh, in the first quarter of last year yep. from that? Yeah, part of that was, was they, the Chinese travel that they couldn't fly anywhere, but now it's getting a little bit better, so maybe that'll, that'll help. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Let's get a sense of where we're going with this market because I, I don't know whether it's time to jump off the uh, big cap tech train that's worked so well for so long and maybe take a look at some of the smaller mid caps, maybe some value. You just you don't know where to go here. David Kudla's got some thoughts here because he does this stuff for a living. He's a founder, chief executive officer, and chief investment officer at Mainstay Capital Management. Joining us via Zoom from Troy, Michigan. It's a lovely town. I've been there once. Uh, David, what say you here? I, I mean, for a lot of investors, that Magnificent Seven has worked so well for so many people. Do you just stay with the you know with that horse, or do you try to maybe look for some value in small cap, mid cap? maybe some of the sectors that have lagged. Yeah, you know, the, and good morning. Good morning, Paul. I, When we look across the market and we know that the Magnificent Seven had a great year last year, up about 110%, and uh, we now have a, a, a Fab Five that excludes Tesla and Apple <laughs> uh, that's doing very well this year. And 
you know, the concern is, is, you know, can we see a sell off in the video with this meteoric rise? Can we see a sell off in these stocks? Of course we can. Um, you know, we, you know, wouldn't be surprised if five or 10% or even more at any given time, given the rally that we've had and the Magnificent Seven this year and the Fab Five last year. But, you know, our overall thesis, we like growth over value and mega cap tech and profitable tech is our most favored sector uh, last year and coming into this year. And we look forward, we look over the next three years at the annual growth rate of the Magnificent Seven, it's four times that of the rest of the S&P 500. If we look at profit margins, uh, they're gonna expand uh, at a lot higher rate than the other 493 stocks. You take out Apple and Tesla, those numbers get even bigger. So we're we're still on growth over value, uh, or I'm sorry, growth over value, large over small. We had a rally in small at the end of last year in small caps, a little bit here recently, mm -hmm. but small caps, you know, the problem that small caps have, if you become a good small cap stock, uh, soon you become a good mid cap. So you could become yeah. a good mid cap stock. So the, the Russell 2000 by definition has that kind of problem. And in the environment we're in with higher rates, it's tough for small caps. And then finally, we like the U.S. over foreign. So, David, to that point, what do you do then? Like all those trades are working. All those trades have been working. Do you just kind of put the positions on and then sit tight and then wait for all that to play out? Yeah, well, the, the approach we're taking is, yes, we are, uh, you know, very dominant in NASDAQ 100, you know, those those mega cap growth stocks were dominant there. Um, we're divi diversified in some other areas uh, and, and need to be. Uh, in the income portion of our portfolio, the thing that's worked so well last year and into this year is holding uh, the ultra short term bonds with high yields. Uh, the, the bond index, U.S. aggregate bond index was, net, you know, was uh, slightly or only slightly up last year when the uh, we look at these uh, ultra short term bonds with high yield of six or seven percent. So if that's the income portion uh, with this uh, growth dominant portion for equities, that's a formula that's still working for a diversified portfolio. So, David, I know you, you prefer U.S. over international markets, but I see it. You mentioned China here in your notes, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, Japan. And I've heard more about hmm. Japan in the last six months than I have in the last 20 years. What's going on in Japan from an investment perspective? Yeah, we've heard more about Japan in the last six months than we have in in the last thirty five yeah, years exactly. because we're right, right. We're we're bumping up the we're bumping up against that high that was set in December of you know nineteen eighty nine when I was Good walking around me. the Stanford campus learning about investing. Right? I mean, it's that long ago. Uh, that giant trough that that we're coming into, and, and Japan has some things going for it. They have still easy monetary policy. Uh, they have the capital flows coming from China. You know, China is nearly uninvestable at this point. And then uh, uh, President Trump comes out and says, if he gets elected, I'm going to put a 60% tariff on all Chinese goods. I mean, with with everything else that's wrong in China, with Evergrande, their real estate sector, all that. Uh, you know, more bad news coming. And, you know, so they've they've been doing a lot from a, a, a stimulus standpoint, but the, that stock market continues to be, you know, uh, mired in a, a, a downdraft. The, if we look at Europe, Europe is, is near recession, kind of in and out of recession. Uh, the UK is in recession. And, and actually we just found out that Japan unexpectedly yep. got its second quarter of negative growth, but we've just got to, easy monetary policy capital flows there um valuations are starting to get a little bit lofty but it's 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 still investable what do you make of the boj and them uh getting off of yield curve control like does that factor in to like your thinking like clearly there's a carry trade that's going to unwind really fast clearly that's going to uh, affect the treasury market does that affect you david it, it affects us in that we're, we're watching what the yen is doing mm -hmm. Uh, because the yen, it just continues to weaken and, and they've come in, they've intervened, the BOJ uh, has intervened several times. But, you know, when they do, those tend to be temporary fixes. Those tend, tend to be just uh, temporary in nature. And, you know, our concern there, really our concern now is with the economy in a more fragile state, 
you know, what will they do in April? Will they finally raise rates? I mean, what they've continued to do while the U.S. went through their massive, you know, uh, 525 basis point increase in rates from zero, Europe raising rates. Uh, we have Japan there that's just maintained this easy monetary policy. They've made some adjustments, but they've got a, a weak currency that continues to weaken, easy monetary policy. And, um, you know, we'll see. But the, the moves that they've made have been have been just just minor, almost uh uh, non, you know, non-events in terms of if they really started to tighten monetary policy, which they haven't. So, David, we're about seventy-five percent of the way through the S and P five hundred earnings. Any themes for you? Any takeaways for you? Any any changes to your portfolio based upon what you're seeing? No, I mean, we you know we're we're beating expectations again. Earnings coming out better than than expected. Uh, we're we're beyond that earnings recession we had last year. Uh, and, and now seeing earnings doing quite well. So, I mean, we're encouraged by that because that's what we want to see with the Fed. Uh, well, we're still concerned about the Fed, obviously. Yep. But no, we're, we're, it's really supporting where we're at in terms of, of growth versus, versus value. I think, you know, as we get into the second half of the year, we think we have some volatility here for a few more months. We get into the second half of the year and we start to see the rate cuts come, if that's June, let's say. Uh, that they start and just re and remember that just weeks ago we were looking at uh march uh, for rate cuts to start if if rate cuts do start that soon and i think it it could maybe even be longer then then we can come in then we can feel more comfortable about dipping into small cap dipping into cyclicals but uh right now i mean we're encouraged by earnings and it's supporting uh the areas that we like right all right David, if I find myself in Troy, Michigan this summer, would you recommend to pay a visit to the Waterford Oaks Wave Pool? Oh, I love wave pools, even though they're creepy and weird. <laughs> I, I think you should. And if you do, give me a call and we'll go down there and, 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 and have some fun. That sounds like a lot of fun. I've been to Troy. Uh, I did one of my internal audit visits when I was at Payne Weber to the Troy, Michigan Payne Weber branch mm. had had a good time there for a week. Good, good folks out there. Uh, David Kudla, thanks so much uh, for joining us. David Kudla, founder. Chief Executive Officer and Chief Investment Strategist at Main State Capital Management. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business App. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Big take store yesterday was about commercial real estate in this country, particularly uh, office space, and uh, how we're seeing that marked down pretty substantially. There's some trades actually happening. And then Alex and I were just talking to you earlier this morning saying, boy, when are some of these smart real estate equity dudes going to come in or do that? It's coming to come into the market and start making some long-term investments. Scott Kelly is one of them. He is a founder and CEO of Atos Capital Real Estate. Uh, he joins us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. We're also joined by Abigail Doolittle, markets reporter for Bloomberg News. She's gonna help us here, kind of get through this story here. Scott, talk to us about how you guys at your firm are kind of viewing the commercial real estate market in this country. Is it time to maybe start bottom fishing? Uh, I think it is. I think it's the beginning of what's gonna be a long process of working things out. Um, we have a company called Wavertree Property Partners, which is in the business of buying oh. uh, distressed real estate loans um, and properties here in the U.S. Um, and interestingly, the, the, the loans are not as concentrated as they have been in the past. When you look at the big real estate investment opportunities, whether it was the RTC, whether it was um, you know, Lehman's bankruptcy, Bear Stearns Lehman, the loans tended to be pretty uh, concentrated. Um, today, I think you find a wide variety of lenders, including a lot of regional banks, um, which are uh, which which hold a lot a lot of these real estate loans. So, we think it's going to be a big opportunity. It's not just going to be an office. Um, apartments are going to be a big opportunity as well. Um, we think that it's important to buy good real estate. At the end of the day, um, you know, cheap doesn't get cheap enough if you don't buy the right thing. So, um, uh, you know, the better properties are going to continue to perform okay, but I think there's a real opportunity for bottom fishing uh, now and over the next several years. So speaking of cheap, Scott, the last time you joined us, and you've been kind enough to give us your time over the last six months or so, preparing for what you've called an epic opportunity uh, last year, both from the gain side and the pain side, 
Uh, I think that we talked about office buildings here in New York going as cheap as 25 cents on the dollar. I know it's very regional. What are our buildings, our properties, loans starting to trade, and what are valuations looking coming in as so far in the first wave of this? Well, they, again, it, it goes market by market, but uh, you know, particularly for obsolete office buildings or, or you know, kind of B minus office buildings, the big talk in the industry is to convert. If you look at Manhattan as an example, too much office space, too little uh, residential. You know, it's too expensive to live here, and there's too much office space. <laughs> um, and the notion is um, that some of these buildings are going to be converted from office to residential. That is a very tall order. It's um, hard to do, right? Like you just don't yeah. like flip a switch and say bye. Right, yeah. and and uh, because light and elevators are the two big light access and elevators are the big issues. Um, the floor plates on office buildings tend to be too big to be laid out really well for apartments. Interestingly, the older office buildings, which have smaller floor plates, um, are easier to adapt, but. Mm. Uh, we did one um, through PTM in, in Washington, D.C. Um, it's not easy to do, and uh, I think it's really um, kind of overblown in terms of how big an opportunity that, that is. The other thing I would say, just in terms of converting, is it's going to take a lot of public-private cooperation to make that happen. Um, the economics in terms of uh, tax, tax breaks, um, uh, help in financing, uh, you know, governments are going to have to find a way to get these buildings viable, um, and it's going to mean working with the private sector in a way that might appear to some to be too generous to the private sector. But, but so in terms of those values, though, and understanding that it is market by market, region by region, if you had to put just a spectrum on it, 25 cents if that's New York City, but if you are you able to say you know, some some sort of average just to give our listeners an idea of how painful it is and could be? Well, I think less, than, ha less than half. And, you know, you, you, you're you going to see things that go for buildings that in their current use can barely pay their property taxes. So, um, right. you know, you're going to see it, it, it uh, values at a at a low. But but again, is it good value even if it appears cheap? Well, that, Alex that's only buys on sale. We're yes. talking about clothes. But <laughs> Alex, there's a few uh, properties, office I only buildings buy out there. property <laughs> when uh, my mortgage rate is 3% or lower. So I'm, I'm not your target audience. <laughs> so do you prefer to buy the actual real estate itself or the mortgage behind it? It, it, it is really um, deal by deal. I think you have okay. to be flexible okay. uh, because you've got to deal usually with the senior lender, with a refinancing yep. um, uh, uh, package, um, and with squeezing out the equity, partnering with the equity, cramming down the equity. Yep. Um, the, the structure needs to be, I think, typically up in the capital structure. So either buying the real estate um, if the senior lender um, you know, wants away. to go through the foreclosure yeah. and just sell the real estate or coming into a structured alternative. But I think importantly, our perspective is that we have to be able to get control of the operations of the real estate because, again, particularly through this syndicator model, a lot of people that really didn't know what they were doing, that would never would have passed the muster for institutional real estate capital got into the business and they're the ones that are in the deepest trouble. So because of people like you though that can do that homework and then step in, will there not be a gigantic commercial real estate crisis? It's just going to be like years of sussing out this stuff and finding the right price? Yes. I, I think there will be years of... But nothing disastrous. Well, it will be disastrous for the people to get wiped out. You know, what I mean, <laughs> whether that happens overnight or over a period of a couple of years, uh, a lot of these people are going to get wiped out. And um, you know, I think uh, I think it's it is a disaster for some is an opportunity for others. And speaking of disaster, Scott, when you joined us in August, you alluded to the idea that the regional banking that there be, could be some kind of a banking crisis worse than what people were anticipating. And lo and behold, the second most popular mm -hmm. uh, article on the Bloomberg Terminal today, dozens of banks rapidly piled up commercial property loans. Speak to us about the regulation and what you see ahead here. Well, I think interestingly, the um, the big banks aren't that exposed to commercial real estate. If you look at, at J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, we've done the analysis on those uh, banks, and they're I think they've learned their lessons, and they're <laughs> not that ex exposed to uh, to commercial real estate. The mi middle-sized banks, a little bit more so. It's the smaller 
banks that have an inordinate concentration of commercial real estate loans. And I think part of the reason was that there was very little commercial loan demand during COVID. People weren't starting new businesses. They weren't you know, opening new restaurants and stores. And the sort of bread and butter business of a smaller bank didn't really exist. So they mm -hmm. poured a lot of money uh, into real estate and they did so with floating rate debt, although it, yep. everybody's yep. against their cap on the floating rate debt pretty much, uh, with very short maturities. So that's nice. the big refinancing wave that's hitting these um, smaller uh, and regional banks. All right. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it, guys. Scott Kelly, founder and CEO of Ados Capital Real Estate. And Abigail, thank you so much, uh, Bloomberg correspondent, for bringing us uh, this interview. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Talk about Cisco. Do you have a, a, a cool like tidbit thing? Did you just remember you this is something? Cisco with a C, not Cisco with an S, the food services yes. and distribution company whose trucks are always ahead of me in the Lincoln Tunnel, slowing my commute. That Cisco is also quite interesting. Uh, they have a huge, huge business model. It's enormous. It's like a company I want to get in there and figure out what's going so on. So if you like a particular restaurant and see a Cisco with an S truck parked out front, they have the food services company. Does that mean the food Napkins, is... Napkins, tablecloths, all the things. But also like prepared foods, don't they? But, the, but like, I think their real business is like tables and silverware and the stuff, the guts. Okay. See? We got, we got something there. Let's go to Cisco, though. The one with the C. Wasn't uh, much. That stock down uh, about 2%. It's it's off its lows, though. Uh, let's bring in uh, Wu Jin Ho. He's Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Technology Analyst to break it all down. Wu Jin, is, did anything really surprise you with Cisco? Like, in some ways, we knew the environment was going to be soft. We knew they were going to have to uh, integrate a takeover, and that was going to have some churn. What was a big standout? Well, I, I, I think uh, you're, you're right there, Alex. Uh, I, I think the, after the job loss leak uh, or job cuts leak from last quarter, I think there were uh, expectations that there were going to be cuts to estimates. Uh, you know, and, and you know, quite, quite frankly, the big standout for me was that the cuts weren't big enough. Um, you know, 5% OPEX cuts, that's par for the course for what Cisco typically does. Uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, given the stock reaction based on reports, it, it looks like uh, there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of this was expected. You know, which I've followed the Cisco name for decades. I mean, it's one of the founding Silicon Valley tech names based in San Jose, right? Smack in the middle of you know, Silicon yep. Valley. What are they not getting right here? The stock hasn't worked for a long time. And it just, what, from your perspective, what are they just missing here? Well, um, let, let's talk about large cap uh, stocks in general, right? If we, if we think about the, the big, Bangs, right? Or, or let's say Microsoft, the the, the old tech uh, guard, uh, yep. Microsoft, Google, right? They all really led on on a cloud software transition. Um, if we think about it from the hardware old guard, Cisco, Dell, HPE, or or the old HP, they're still relatively a hardware business. So you're not going to get the the fast, sexy growth. Uh, from from the hard hardware business. I mean, if you look at Cisco, you know, after the estimate cuts, um, 52 billion for fiscal 24, that brings them back to 2024 levels, right? So you're not getting the growth uh, that people want, and also you're not getting the margin profiles mm -hmm. uh, that, that that you want as well. So uh, that's why the multiples are lower and, and and the growth is shallower. So has the stock then re-rated for that? I mean, from what we say, we kind of knew that was coming. So are we at a right level, a right valuation for it? Yeah, so so if, if I look at the historical valuation uh, for for Cisco, we're, what it's trading around 13 times right now. Uh, Cisco typically trades roughly around uh, 15 to 17 times, so it, it was it was priced to be cut, right? Um, now now the question is is uh, what does this pending Splunk deal do, and does that help reinvigorate growth? Now what I will say is that estimates consensus estimates probably won't bake in uh, the Splunk deal, which adds about another eight percent. Uh, on on sales, uh, neutral to earnings near term, but it could spark earnings growth if they start bringing uh, OPEX uh, or, or operating margins for Splunk uh, more in line to where Cisco is today. So, you know, it's Alex, I mean, over the last mm -hmm. 
five years. I'm using the comp function, C-O-M-P, which is Matt, one of Matt Miller's favorite functions. Um, so over the last five years, this stock has compounded 3% per year, Cisco. S&P 500, 14.5%. Yep. The S&P information technology sector, uh, 26%. So it's really, really underperformed. Going forward, would you, I guess over the next several quarters, what are, what's Cisco saying about their customers and inventory and, you know, what are they, I mean, the, cutting this forecast suggests that they don't have a lot of great visibility here. Yeah, so so if if, um, if you remember the, the server and storage uh, cycle uh, uh, from a year ago, uh, Cisco is going through that right now. Um, part of it is because of the supply chain glut, uh, all of a sudden their customers got their uh, equipment two quarters ago and they're taking their time uh, implementing it. So, you know, uh, typical cycles uh, are roughly five to six quarters. Um, I was running through the numbers and we're talking about 30%, anywhere between 27 to 30% declines for the next two to three quarters for Cisco. And they're probably not gonna get out of it and return to growth until, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, for the networking business, not sales, uh, mm -hmm. for the network ne networking business. But uh, I, I don't think uh, they, they won't get out of this decline until the second half of fiscal year, which is about a year from now, right? So, um, you know, again, the model is going to be reworked primarily because of the uh, the Splunk deal. And um, the hope is, is that they're going to have more recurring revenues uh, to uh, boost up the multiples uh, going forward. Right, so sub subscriptions basically, um, rather than just exactly. here's your bit of hardware, see you guys later. Um, mm -hmm. Where's the AI component for Cisco? I, I, I will tell you, um, they're making a lot of good progress. And um, they, they had a, a billion dollars in bookings uh, in backlog orders with cloud customers. And um, uh, I, the issue is, is that that only represents 2% of total orders. Right, so it's still relatively small. It is going to be growing, and they're probably going to uh, bang the drum louder to the uh, uh, on, on the AI uh, on the AI theme over the next couple of quarters as these deals really start to to balloon. Um, the the one thing is, again, it's it's still a corporate IT name. Uh, if I were to pick, if I may, if I were to pick one AI name on the networking side, it's probably going to be more Arista than Cisco for now. So again, is, is there a way, which is broadly defined on, on the hardware side, have investors embraced any of the hardware names as AI plays? Is it, because it just doesn't feel like it. It feels like what I'm hearing from, you know, a, a lot of your folks that on the tech team of Bloomberg Intelligence, it's kind of software applications, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so, so I, I can name four. <laughs> yep. Right. Uh, Arista Networks, right? If, if you look at that stock, uh, that's been up uh, 80, 88%. Wow. Uh, Supermicro, that's been up 846% uh, over the past oh. year, right? Um, and Dell, that's been up 10%. There's, and they reported in a couple of weeks, uh, there's a growing uh, AI story there. And one, one name that's been um, underappreciated is probably HPE. They, they have a uh, supercomputing business, high performance computing business, but uh, the story is a little muddled because of a pending Juniper deal. Um, and then there's, um, you know, my, my colleague, Steve Zhang, he covers the white box uh, vendors and there's some uh, white box vendors that may potentially uh, benefit from the, from, uh, because they sell server equipment uh, to, to the cloud guys. So you were saying that the AI stuff growing about 2% a year kind of thing, it, is that considered good? <laughs> uh, when you no, obviously well, compare well, it to a different kind of company like NVIDIA, it's not. But for Cisco in this area, would that be good? It, it's 2% of total sales, okay. right? I, I suspect that, those, that sales rate could potentially grow uh, well into the double digits over the next couple of years. Uh, they are one of the arm suppliers uh, for AI. Um, and you've had me on the show before. We, we've had this... Uh, conversation, a technology conversation between Ethernet and InfiniBand, you're going to start seeing this burgeoning shift from NVIDIA's InfiniBand technology to uh, a, a, an open standard called Ethernet. And that's where Cisco is going to benefit over the next uh, several years. Um, okay, so short term, what's next? Like, what are you most interested in? Is it going to be the Splunk, like acquisition and yeah. getting that done and, and how that's going to be merged? I, exactly. I mean, look, it, it, it's... Probably, well, first of all, I, I think that uh, earnings cuts 
may have bottomed. Okay. Right, earnings are bottomed from here. Uh, the next thing I need to do is fold in the Splunk estimates when once they uh, announce that deal, and then uh, and just keep track of uh, where IT spending is uh, as a rel uh, relative to Cisco, and as well as keep track of, of where the AI story goes. Right, they had had a couple of nice announcements. We just need more and, and, and start to see it in the numbers in fiscal 25. All right, Wuj, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Wu Jin Ho joining us from Bloomberg Intelligence. This is the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern, on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, tune in, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.